Here we are today, boxing fans, with a very special interview with USS Steve Cunningham getting ready to take on Tyson Fury on the 20th in New York City. Uh, Steve, how are you doing today? Good, you know, um, ready to fight. Uh, training camp is basically pulled down to finish almost, and, um, you know, it's uh, fight time. Let me ask you this. Um, do you feel since you got a, a shot with one of the uh, you know, up-and-coming contenders in the division, do you feel that basically the boxing world looked at you as the winner of the Adamic fight uh, in December and that's the reason you're getting this, this shot? I mean, yeah, to an extent, yeah, I feel that. Um, I, I, it's not too much I can say about that fight. You know, you can look at it and see for yourself. It's obvious, but... You know, there are some say, oh, it was close to this, but it wasn't like that in my eyes at all, um, or or a lot of the millions of the fans. So maybe this is, you know, like, uh, okay, we're still going to look out for this guy, which which is great to know that this does happen in boxing, you know? Yeah, and unfortunately, it, uh, it's just happening too much is the problem. Um, but let me ask you this, uh, Fury... Definitely the largest man you've ever been in the ring with. Uh, what kind of sparring are you getting to get ready for taking on such a large opponent? Uh, what kind of sparring? Um, we, we've got some big guys, you know. We've got uh, a few big guys that we've been working with, and uh, my trainer doesn't want me to divulge the names for some reason. But, you know, we've got guys about six, seven, six, eight. You know, that's the thing. That's the main thing for sparring is you want to uh, imitate you know, the guy that you're fighting. So, of course, again, some big guys, man. And uh, it's it's been it's been a, a heavy order, you know, a tall order. But, you know, we, we're working, we working on what we're going to do in the fight, and everything's coming along great. And are you feeling that more and more you're feeling uh, comfortable as a heavyweight, adding more muscle and just feeling more like a, a full heavyweight at this point? Yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling very comfortable. I... Uh, when I came in for the for my first heavyweight fight with Jason Gavin, I was 208. I felt very comfortable, very relaxed, very um. Excuse me for a second. I felt very uh, uh, comfortable, man. Energetic. Um. Uh. I mean, as a cruiserweight, I I ran so much. You know, I ran like a middleweight trying to make weight. I uh. You know, I was just working out so hard because that was my mindset. It was just work, 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 work. Uh, but now as a heavyweight, I'm, uh, you know, and being a little older and wiser, knowing what my body, you know, how my body will feel, and and just just paying attention to my body, putting this weight on has been very, uh, it's been good for me actually. And do you feel that having to work so hard to make cruiser weight might be the reason that you've been on the canvas a few times, and this is just you're coming in healthier now, and that won't be as much of a liability? Yeah, I totally do. I mean. Uh, you know, Jason Gavin, you know, to all his credit, you know, he was, what, 240-something pounds, you know. He had a few good rights, a couple good rights in there. Uh, Tomas Adamick, you know, he caught me with a couple, few good rights in there. Uh, I just felt comfortable. I took those shots well. I, I think I put a little, a lot of taxing on my body with the way I was working out as a cruiserweight. I never got over 200 as a cruiserweight because I wouldn't, I just wouldn't let me get over 200 for some, you know, that's just... I was just working so much, you know, um, I would run and, and, and just do all this stuff. And I leave the gym at 193 pounds. You know, I, I was always under the weight. So uh, I think that was a, um, I think that was taxed into my body. Absolutely. And um, let me send this over to Kurt Ward. I know these guys have a few questions for you as well. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Um what, you 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 were in the cruiserweight division, and you know you at one stage you had victories over the other three men who held the titles, you know. And why do you think the cruiserweight division wasn't or isn't as popular in the states as it should be, or as popular as it is in Europe? I don't know. I mean, that's a question I've asked myself for years. You know, scratching my head just as much as yeah. other people have. Um, you know, you had at one point you had O'Neill Bell. Um, Wayne Braithwaite, John Mark Mormont, you know, myself was I was just coming up into the um top championship rankings. There was a lot of cruiserweights, Luis Azil, so just a whole lot of cruiserweights that were um exciting, you know, but 
um, just you get one network television fight, and the O'Neill Bell Mormon fight was on Showtime, and it was great. But it's just they just didn't. I don't know. I think truthfully, I think because Don King had all of the cruiserweights at the time. You know, he had me, Mormon, Braithwaite, Kelvin Davis. He had you know all of the cruiserweights, and I know that there was a lot of friction with Don and some of the network. So maybe that's what kind of helped keep us under. I don't know. Yeah, because it, it is so surprising, because like you said, you know, the Cruiserweight is an action-packed division, you know, there's so many fights, I mean, you've been included in so many of them, it's full of excitement, and it seems to get the same rap as the heavyweight division, you know, that it's not an exciting division, it's just strange. It's very strange, man, you know, uh, it's it's and, and what I'm noticing now is even just the name heavyweight brings so much more excitement, and so much, it just brings more attention for some reason, just the name in it itself, you know, uh, I, uh, I was a two-time cruiserweight champ, and I had open workouts here in Philly before I went to Germany or wherever I fought. And uh, you know, it was it was it was you know probably like five, four or five people there. But now, heavyweight, I come to the gym and it's crowded. You know, it's packed, and it's like wow. You know, it's just something about the word heavyweight. You know. And when you went over to Germany, you signed with um, Sauerland. You know, was there ever? The, the chance of making the Hook rematch because you obviously hold the victory over Hook and I know he he was vocal at times saying he wanted the rematch and it never seemed to happen. It never happened. Uh, for oh, you know, I mean, I heard. Well, first let me answer. Um, that's that was the main reason I signed this island. You know, I figured that the rematch would have been very lucrative. You know, especially in Germany. You know, with Hook, you know, being a reigning champion now. Uh, me having a belt again, you know, uh, I thought it would be a, a great, massive unification fight. Uh, Solomon was trying to do the Super Six tournament with the Cruiserweights, and that kept falling through. You know, they had these guys, and that wouldn't happen, and that wouldn't work. And, you know, that was the thing we were really waiting for was that Super Six tournament because, as you see, it did wonders for Andre Ward and all those guys on the Super Six, you know, um, Kessler, um, Frotch, and Glenn Johnson. It just did wonders. So I was like, man, I would love to be in a tournament like that. That will help the fan base. That will help the fans get a chance to see cruiserweights. But um, but another thing we heard that inside Marco Hook's camp or Sauerland's camp, they didn't want uh, they didn't want Hook to fight me again because they felt he would lose. And he's the ca- he was the cash cow, you know. So okay. they didn't want you you know to mess that money up. Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just ask you, uh, you, you sparred as well with Vladimir Klitschko not too long back, but was it last year or just when he fought David High? Yeah, that, uh, that was a real good experience, man. Um, to to be able to just get in the ring, just on, you know, on the sparring level with Vladimir, and and to see how they work, and to see you know all the talk about you know um, behind the scenes, you know, and 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 it's not just you know Vladimir works hard, he works very hard. He's very skilled, you know. We we had a good sparring sessions, and uh, you know I, I see why he's a world champion, you know. So uh, I mean I learned a lot from that. I'm sure he learned from me, and uh, we both enjoyed each other's company. And you know, with him being, you know, obviously he's a big guy like Tyson Fury's. I mean, have you seen much of Tyson Fury's, you know, previous fights at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've watched uh, we watched some of his fights, and uh, you know, of course, my trainer Nazim Richardson. He's a student of boxing. He he watches fights. He he watches my fights, my opponents' fights. Say, hey, this is how they're gonna attack you. This is how you're gonna attack them. This is what we're gonna do. So we sat down a few times and watched some fights. And you know, I got some uh, tutelage from my trainer about you know the things he saw about Fury, the good and the bad. Andy, you got any questions? Hi, Steve. How you doing, mate? Thanks for coming on the show. Um, you've had eight world title fights, seven of which have been in Europe. Um, would you say that the Marco Hook fight was your best performance, or was it beating without checking the rematch to finally become champion after the the slight robbery in the first fight? Um, I think I'm tell you the truth. With me, I don't know. I don't even think I've had a best performance yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, with me uh, on what I, I believe I can do. Um, but I'd say Marco Huck was probably my most satisfying fight because 
you know, just everything that went into that fight. You know, I was going to his hometown, his home city, his home country. Uh, you know, he was younger than me. Everyone said he was going to do this to me. I was a four or five to one underdog. You know, he talked so much trash and, you know, made jokes about me. And just beating that guy like that was the, that was the biggest cherry on top that I could ever imagine. It's a great fight, actually. It's a great fight. Um, just you're talking about Sutherland there, and for instance, you know, I remember reading that interview with him. He said that Europe generates the best atmosphere. Um, so, given the the division you were in at the time, you know, you said it was pretty well paid. How did you feel that the promotional company actually treated you? Did, you know, did they look after you? Um, it was one of those things where we knew at that time when we signed with Sutherland, we knew that they wanted the belt. You know, uh, we thought at first, when we first signed with them, we had hopes and aspirations that, you know, because we seen how they promoted their fighters. You know, we seen how they got behind Huck, how they got behind Abraham and these guys. And we're like, wow, we're coming in with the title shot and we won the title. So we're figuring, you know, every fighter wants to get treated like he's a champ, you know, <laughs> even mm-hmm. the ones with the belt, especially the ones with the belt. So. After, um, I guess after that first Troy Ross fight, then then I fought uh, Enat Lucina. Um, we started seeing, we just started noticing things because we we had plans that in, in a direction that we wanted to go, and they had their direction, you know. And yeah, because like, there was there was talk of the Super Eight tournament, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a Super Six or whatever. They were trying to switch it to a Fantastic Four, which just got that bad, and we were trying to hold on for that. But there were other things involved, like, you know, uh, we kind of, it was just things, you know, little things that we weren't, we felt we weren't getting treated like a champion. And they, it seemed like they couldn't hide their their intentions. You know, they wanted to get that mm-hmm. belt, but it, they didn't know how. So when the Hernandez fight, actually, I was supposed to, I was looking for a fight. They were, they were, um obligated contractually to give me another fight after the Lucina fight within like four months and uh, Hernandez was supposed to fight Guillermo Jones and that fell through and it was just like they got two cruiserweights waiting for fights hey let's fight them so I felt I was the best cruiserweight in the world and with that first Hernandez fight with the doctor stopping it the way he did I just felt disgusted you know it was Mm -hmm. just like wow you know um you're gonna do it like that (laughs) you know you want to take my belt like that and we always knew that um and i'm not saying silent had that you know did that or is that that doctor did that but it's just things at the press conference like the press conference was all for hernandez you know even Mm -hmm. the first you know it was videos of him you know we're at the press conference and they're showing a video of him a documentary basically on him defecting from cuba and then it's hey here's Steve Cunningham, you know, and I'm like, yeah. well, you? you know, I'm the champion, you know, but we knew then that they just wanted the belt. But it's one of those things, you know, I'm, I'm in this business to fight and they can do all they want, but they can't fight for the guy, you know. So but they they got the belt for him, you know. So after that, we got the rematch. And, you know, like I said, I can't perform angry. I was so angry just at the way the business was going. Uh, we were we were fed up with what with what was going on with Sireland to the extent just and it wasn't just Sireland what they were doing it really wasn't too much of what they were doing but you know that guy you know Hernandez was Sireland's guy you know he was managed yeah. by the promoter he was managed by my promoter and his promoter so you know that's legal in Europe you know or in Germany so not it's not legal in America it's torture interference so it's like if you got a guy you want to win it's the guy you're managing and I just felt the chips were totally stacked against they already stacked against me but it's just like wow but i still had to fight you know yeah i feel like you've been disrespected yeah i mean yeah i, I totally felt that i mean at the press conference they were talking at the second press conference uli wegner and um Sauerland, uh one of the promoters they were just talking you know talking german having a conversation <laughs> While my team was supposed to be at the microphone, and I, that just infuriated me, man. I was so mad, you know, and it, that that kind of helped me just be angrier, you know, because I'm like, wow, they're really doing this in front of everybody, you know. It's just like they don't care. They, it's like they already know what's going to happen, you know, well, whatever. So they're having their conversation and talking, and it was just so disrespectful. And as you can see, 
you can look it up on YouTube at the press conference. I kind of flipped out, you know, on Hernandez. It wasn't Hernandez's fault. Dude, he's a fighter, you know, uh, trying to make a living just like I am. Um, I don't think he had a hand. He's in there fighting, you know, but uh, it was just the, the whole business side of it just disgusted me. Yeah. Steve, just, just before we come on to the Tyson Fury fight, um, just cast your mind back to the Thomas Adamick fight. Uh, I personally had you winning that fight by two points. Um, what was the situation with the scorecards after the fight? Man, well, this is my thing. Like, with these judges, I don't know. It's like, did the judges have the scorecards already written out or something? You know, it's just ridiculous. But one of the judges' scorecards had me, oh, had the score, had the score, I think it was 114, 114, or 115, 115. And it was like, that's technically po- impossible, you know? Um, it's like they wrote the scorecards out wrong. Everything was just messed up, you know? It showed their, um, a little shadiness was behind that, you know? Mm-hmm. I just was, uh, I mean, what more can I do? You know, I could have, what I could have done was, um, protest for immediate rematch, but that was the tournament. And then I would have to wait, have to have wait for Adamic to fight Pulev, which would have brought me to, like, late this year, you know? Right. uh-huh. So and then truthfully, that's me spending. I and when you do the protest, a lot of people don't know you have to spend money. You put ten thousand dollars. You know, that's a ten thousand dollar fee to do the protest. And I was just like, why, why? You know, me personally at the time, I didn't, I didn't want to rematch. I, I did it. You know, I did what I set out to do. You know, I felt I lost a very close fight, even with three knockdowns the first time. And I set out to to basically show people I can beat this guy. And I, I felt I did that. Uh, but he said it himself, you know, there will not be a, a third Steve Cunningham fight, you know, as for Cunningham doesn't want to fight, he wants to, you know, Adam had all these reasons and excuses, it's just, he's a limited fighter, you know, and, you know, everyone sees that he cannot, uh, he cannot not get hit by a right hand, you know, this guy mm-hmm. just right hands, and Eddie Chambers showed you that with one hand, you know. In the in the build up to the sorry in the the press conference just after the press conference with Tyson Fury and, and I think it was in New York I think you said afterwards that you were short list of four fighters to fight Fury. Um, who was the other three? Did you think maybe Fury's maybe uh, avoiding some of the top ten fighters at the minute? Well, I know I know Michael Grant was on there. I know that for sure. I know I I don't know the other names, but they were there were a couple bigger bigger guys, way bigger than me that were on the list. And just like we said, um, we were saying this before, once we found, I, my, my wife knows the names, I don't remember them all. But, you know, we my, my trainer was like, you know, if he picks the fight, they think they can beat you, you know? And it's like, why pick why pick the smaller guy on, I mean, I'm happy they picked me, you know, because I, I feel I'm gonna win, you know? This is a good time for me to shine. But, uh, you know, it's like if you feel you're the best, and he says he's the best fighter in the world, heavyweight or whatever. Uh, if you're the best fighter in the world, that's like Floyd Mayweather picking, uh, you know, a guy who's just starting or, or yeah, a guy with, with less fights than him, someone who's totally under him that he shouldn't even be fighting, you know, to fight. And then and then bragging about what you're going to do, you know. So I let him, you know, that's their mindset. Um, it's not going to be an easy fight for him. It's not going to be a walk through, a walk over, and um, he's in for a surprise. Yeah, um, Steve, we um, we spoke to Peter Fury, Tyson's trainer, a couple of days ago, and you know he 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 was really complimentary of you, and you know he said it's it's not going to be an easy fight. You know he, he said you know you're obviously a really good boxer, and you're you're quick, and you're going to be moving. So I think you know I know Tyson said things at the press conference, but you know his trainer, you know obviously doesn't feel that way at all. I mean, my thing is, if you don't mean it, don't say it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, Fury, like, is, Fury is exceptional at trash talking. That's It's it's one of his intangible skills, and if you haven't fallen into that trap, more power to you on that one. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we understand, you know, that's what he does, you know? And I've been in, like I said, you know, I've been in numerous fights and guys have talked trash. It's just this guy, my thing with... Our thing with him is you. First off, you've got the advantage already. You've already got the advantages. You're, you're six foot eight, nine, whatever you are. You know you're undefeated. You're young. 
you've got all these advantages. The fights, all of the show is for you. You know what I mean? Uh, so take that and be happy with it. But you still want to, you, it's like you want to be the star. You want to be more of a star. So um, he just runs his mouth and runs his mouth. He's going to retire me. Tell your family, your wife. I don't play those games, man. You know, um, boxing isn't a, um, it isn't a sport that's played casually. You know, this is a, this is a lifestyle. You know, if this guy hits me wrong, I can go, I can, I can be into a coma or something. You know, if if I hit him wrong, the same thing could happen or, or differently. So this isn't a game. This is real life to me. So um, I don't play, um, I'm going to disrespect you, and then we can shake hands later. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. You know, I'm a real person. I'm a real man. You know, I got real feelings. Don't, um... Don't come up here and imitate or fake something and then, oh, you know, I was just kidding. Like, come on, man, get out of here. But I know some of his tactics, he gets on the guy's skin and they want to just come in and just fight him. You know, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt him, you know. So, um, I'm, listen, I've been doing this for years and, and I, listen, I'm ready to get here, do my job and do it well. Steve, I I have a question for you about more of the, the big picture on if there's, you know, what might really be wrong with the sport. Um. You know, you, you get certain fighters that seem to get decisions. Then you get sanctioning bodies that um, go above and beyond for certain people. Like, you mentioned Guillermo Jones earlier, and uh, I believe it was the WBA, and he had, you know, two defenses in, like, three years or something yeah. where they back him up. And, you know, you have scorecards like a guy like Malik Scott, who absolutely goes in there and schools a guy like Glasgow, and nobody really has seen Malik Scott fight. Do you think it's because... The promote certain promotional entities have an absolute effort to keep some people out of the spotlight because they don't think they can sell them. Uh, well, yeah, that's part of the fight. And the thing is, why couldn't Malik Scott be sold? You know, a guy like Malik Scott, why couldn't his fight be sold to the public? And and this is my answer. My answer is because the public. Most of the public, you've got your hardcore boxing fans, guys that respect the fighter who jabs, <clears throat> who, who works, who uses footwork, who uses speed, who, who hits and doesn't get hit. That's one of the first rules in boxing. Uh, you got people that respect that. Those are hardcore fight fans. Then you have a casual fight fan who just wants to see a good fight. And that guy makes up predominantly <laughs> most of the money, you know what I mean? Most of the fan base. You know, the guy who wants to come to the fight and gets drunk, you know, and just knock him out. You know, um, they want to see that. So the knockout fight style is popular. Marcos Maidana, this guy, he's a good fighter. He's a powerhouse, but he loses and they still bring him back. He's back, back. He's back in a title shot, you know, title spot. Why? Because he puts guys down. People want to see punishment. They don't want to see a guy uh, boxing and being smart. They want to see like Neanderthalish <laughs> toe-to-toe, rock'em, sock'em robots. So when a promoter gets a guy like that, he's more marketable than the boxing guy, you know, unless the boxing guy is, is knocking guys out. I guess that's, I mean, a prime example is look at the Klitschko brothers. They're knocking dudes out, but people don't like the way they fight. They don't like their fight style here in America, you know. Uh, people are used to Mike Tyson being heavyweight champ. They want to see a uh, knockout brawl. They want to see you take punches and give some back. So... When you have a Steve Cunningham in there or Malik Scott who are, who, who are students of the sport and we're not trying to get hit, um, we're not running. We're, we're, we're in there rolling punches. We take shots and we give them, you know. So that's the thing is now it's not attractive. And you've got, um, you've got a lot of people. And another thing is you've got a lot of people in boxing like judges, referees that aren't, that have never boxed before. You know, they, they, they're they just fans of the sport and they like it. They want to be part of it. They can't put the gloves on, so they'll, they'll be part of it some other way. And, I mean, take my fight, for instance. These judges, they scored the 10th round. The two judges who gave it to Adam scored the 10th round for him, and that was my best round. You know, I mean, he barely touched me that round. It's like, how is that possible? So these guys, they just want to see a guy who walks forward. Walking forward isn't, that's ridiculous. You know, that shouldn't win you a fight. I can walk forward and get hit, but it's, um, it's, man, what's hurting boxing is the judging. You've got people need to be, the fan base and the fighters need to be letting on what 
do you judge a score to fight his own? You know? And, but then you do still have that other entity, money, marketing, and, I mean, corruption, corruptness is going to be around in every sport, man. It's just, in boxing, it's just too easy <laughs> to do it. Do, do you think that judges might actually try to score for who they, who is perceived or who the promoter, you know, is noted for having as the more marketable fighter. Do you, do you believe that they might be trying to find rounds to give to that person because they're afraid that they won't be able to get the top tier judging jobs if they don't keep the promoter stars in business? Um, I mean, I can't speak for them. You know, I don't know every judge, but I mean, that's possible. You know, we're all human. You know, humans do that. You know, people want to come back. People want another job. They want another shot at the big fight. Maybe. Maybe that's in some people's hearts. I, I know it's possible. My thing is, I don't put nothing past any human being. I, I read the Bible, and the Bible tells me that the heart of man is inherently evil. You know, from the beginning, we got to be taught to be good. So uh, if somebody says, oh, so-and-so did this. I won't, you know, I wouldn't put it past him. Okay, he's capable. Every man is capable of doing some old evil, foul stuff. So, yeah, there may be judges out there that do that. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure we've seen it. But I mean, I can't say who is and who isn't. But uh, I mean, it's possible. Just one of the other things, obviously, going on in the sport with with every sport right now are concerns over performance enhancing drugs. Um, kind of a double part question for you here. One. Do you feel like there is any sort of a strong enough testing element in place that is actually getting all the people? And two, have you or do you know of, you know, just common of just any fighter, don't even have to name names, but I mean, is it common to be approached by people in the gym about, we got this for you, it'll help you out, give you that extra edge? Uh, what's the first part is, I'm sorry. What was the first question, first part of the question? The first part is, do you think that the testing is actually getting all the people that are guilty of using performance-enhancing drugs? <laughs> no, no way. No, I've heard, uh, I've heard all kind of, you know, in, in boxing is a very small community. So, you know, you got guys in training camp that come, camp, that come from that camp and everybody talks. Talks and talks, you know, promoters talk or, or you know, whatever. Everybody talks. And, um, no, there's not, um, no, everybody's not getting caught. There's more people using PEDs than, than, than people think. And it's been going on longer than, than than people think. Right now, we've just been having this rash of, uh, you know, incidents where we've been, uh, where they've been catching guys. But that stuff has been going on for so long. It's, um, it's an ongoing problem. And, I mean, truthfully, me personally, I feel... If a guy gets caught using PEDs, he should be he should be banned from boxing because you already can kill somebody with with just normal strength hitting them with a glove. Now you're now you're super juiced up and you 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 you're actually you're like Superman in there. You know it's like, come on man, you know this you know it's wrong. Now if we can prove that you didn't know what you were getting, which is horse crap, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Then, then you should just be suspended. But if, if we can prove that you knew what you were doing, and, and and this and that, you should be you should be banned from boxing, man. People die in this sport. Now, for the second part, what was the second question? The second part was basically have have you ever been approached or any of your gym mates been approached by someone offering that thing that'll give them that extra edge? I mean, is it common to run into people trying to dish out um, PEDs at the gym? No, no it's not um, because people. No, I haven't seen it. You know, um, I know I know of some fighters. I'm not saying any names, but I know of a fighter through a fighter who says this guy takes pets, or he's taking pets throughout his career, and he he's so caught up on the pets he can look at other fighters and tell you what they're using. <laughs> you know, uh, you can tell by a fighter's body shapes. So. Um, I but I've never been, and I know a lot of fighters. I'm close with a lot of guys. I haven't heard anybody say that they've been. They, I think it's just fighters that are looking for it. You know what I mean? It's not one of those things like, oh, the trouble found me. No, in that situation, most likely you're gonna go find it. You know, so uh, that shows. Uh, uh, what do they call that? Uh, um, premeditation of of cheating. You know, so. Yeah. Um, 
I know um, I, I had uh, this one guy I was talking to. He's a track trainer. And, you know, he seen me at the track running sprints for years. And, you know, we became friends and talk. And I told him, hey, this was years ago. Yeah, I might be going up to heavyweight. This is before I decided to go to heavyweight. And he's like, yeah, well, I can get you this stuff, you know, this Russian bear and help put extra muscle on. I'm like, well, what's all that? You know, and I talked to my wife and we, we like looked it up. And we're like, oh, no, bro. <laughs> You know, so it's like a lot of it's people that want to get into boxing, um, you know, and they, they just want you to win. They think to you is just about winning. You know, for me, it's, it's about winning, but being right winning. You know, when when after my career is over, I can happily say I was a two time world champion. I never took anything, you know, uh, in, enhancement, you know, that was illegal. You know, well, and you did it with honor then. I mean, and, and that matters a lot more than getting um, things through trickery. Yeah, no doubt. Here's a question about you. I, I know he's not in the stable with you under Nazim Richardson anymore. Um, and going back maybe to when boxing commissions need to step in and stuff, uh, you know, keep a fighter from harming themselves by staying in the ring. Do, do you think that Shane Mosley is making a mistake by continuing his career? Nah, because, in, in a, I mean, I don't think he can perform at that level anymore. I mean, you know, that's me. Who knows? He may be, but it's the thing with a fighter. He, a guy like him, you had to be with yourself, within yourself to, to retire and sit down. He's been doing this all his life. So this is what he knows. So he may feel, oh, I might not be able to beat this dude, but I'm going to give him a good fight, you know, or, and he still can, I don't know. I guess he still generated a couple hundred thousand. You know, that's all right. That's decent money to me, you know. So, I mean, but he, he's doing what he likes to do. Um, I don't think I don't think he should be in there with, uh, you know, Manny Pacquiao's or Floyd Mayweather's right now or, or, or anymore. I think, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, he started stepping back and he's fighting guys. I don't know. Who is he fighting next? Um, he's, he's fighting a Pablo Cano, the one that gave uh, Malik Nagy a really good fight, a uh, really disputed decision uh, a few months ago that's last good, year. I don't think that's a super dangerous fight for him. I mean, the kid may beat him. He may not beat him. You know, Shane may rise to the occasion on that guy. I know certain fighters you can shine on and some you can't. So I, I think, um, I mean, it's just like Evander Holyfield, you know, at the time, he was still making able to make a million dollars a fight. You know, it's like, man, why why should this guy sit down? You know, if he can go overseas or, or fight somewhere and make almost a million dollars, let the man do what he's been doing. You know, he's been doing it all his life. But um, you have a problem when you have guys that have taken a, a step back, and then you see, you can see it, the fans can see it, and and when they're really getting beat up, you know, that's when you have a real problem. You know, so. I mean, Shane uh, Canelo really put some work on him, but that's that's Canelo, you know. So I guess we'll see what this guy that he fights, you know. What do you, what do you think about sometimes? Have you seen fighters who you see them in the gym and you expect so much out of them on fight night, and then on fight night for some reason they're just flat? I mean, how often do you see that where the gym work seems to be so much better than what's in the ring? Um, you see that? You see that here and there. It's just the thing. That's a mental thing within the fighter, you know. Or, or something may be wrong. I mean, I know there's been fights. I fought. I fought fights with the flu. You know, I fought a fight in Germany with the flu. I defended my title against Ina Lucina, and I literally had the flu. But the fight had already been pushed back, pushed up a month or two months. And, you know, um, I, I just was like, I can't stop this fight. You know, uh, we need to make the money. I don't want to mess the money up for the promotion team. You know, I was just thinking team, you know, so the fight must go on. And I felt, you know, I could do it. Um, I felt I would have stopped them if I what if I didn't have a flu. But, you know, we went 12 rounds and, you know, I, I, I pushed and I worked and, and it was hard. But we did it. But um, so some people may look at that fight and say, well, hey, Cunningham, you look you look step back that fight, you know. But you never know what's going on with a fighter, you know. So, uh but they'll still get, we'll still get in and perform or try. Absolutely. And I mean, that's much to be respected. I mean, you guys do out, go out there and put your lives on the line in every time, but, um, let me throw this over to Andy Patterson for a couple more. And, um, I, I know you're probably busy with your camp here. Steve, um, 
in, in the UK recently there's been talk of a potential fight between Bernard Hopkins and Nathan Cleverly. If you had a chance to speak to Bernard, then is that fight a real possibility of happening? No, I don't know. Um, I haven't spoken to Bernard since his fight with um, uh, to first cloud. Uh, we don't, yeah, we don't really talk, you know, business like that. If uh, I don't know what's going on, you know, if that guy you can pick anybody to fight, I still root for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, just another thing as well. Yeah, you, you know, I read an interview with you about I think it was maybe about a year ago or something. You said that you invested your money pretty wisely, but you made as a cruiserweight champion. You're 36 now. How long do you intend to keep fighting, and will you stay in boxing after you're retired? Um, yeah, we've um, we we've, we've made some okay investments. A couple, you know, haven't done good, but you know, we got a few. We own a pizza shop. We own a couple properties. Uh, with the you know, with the little bit of money I made as a cruiserweight, you know, we did something with it. I'm not living like a two-time champ, but I mean, I feel good. You know what I'm saying? I got a great mm-hmm. family. I'm happy. Uh. We, um, I don't know, man, with, you know, I fight as long as I, you know, as long as I can perform, you know, and, and to this level, you know, um, and, and beat guys. Um, and, um, yeah. What was the other part of the question? Um, will, will you stay in boxing after you've re- retired? Will you train fighters or uh, teach them in the gym or amateurs or something like that? Right now, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm helping train my son and my nephew. You know, they're amateurs. My son just had his first amateur fight last year. Steve Jr. and um, I want to I want to get certified to be a referee or or also a judge, you know, because I I totally feel every fighter should should give back to the sport that has that they love that they participated in for so long. Um, I think I think if every fighter did this, boxing would be a lot better, you know. Uh, mm-hmm wouldn't have a lot of issues if, if there were ex fighters that were judging fights we would still have issues but you know i don't think it would be as bad as it is you know if there were ex fighters that were referees judges and even promoters you know that's happening more um i you know i'm i'm gonna try to be like an amateur judge or referee and then try to move into the pros probably later um this this question comes from one of our members in the forum demo um he's asking if you could share a ring with any fighter from any era who would it be um, man, you know what? It would be, <laughs> it would be funny. I would love to fight. This is, this goes way back to, I would love to get in the ring with a Jack Johnson, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'd win or lose, but I, I, I know I'd learn from that fight no matter how it went. You know, I would learn because he was so awesome. A uh, guy like Jack Johnson and then also, um, Oh man, if I could get down the size of Sugar Ray Leonard, man, Woo. you know, like like a guy like me, I learn from who I fight and who I spar. You know, and I've always been that way. Take from who I who I've sparred, and like I said, if I get in there with Sugar Ray Leonard, he might kick my butt, but I would I would take some of his stuff from him. You know, I'd use <laughs> use what he used on me on other guys. <laughs> Cut. Yeah, Steve. Um. Y- this fight with Fury is like as billed as the an IBF heavyweight eliminator for the number two spot, and the other guy who is like highly ranked by the IBF is um, Kubrat Pulev, who isn't fighting Adamek now because you know, Adamek looks like he didn't want the fight. Now it's rumored over here that Pulev could be fighting David Hay, and that could be happening in on June 29th. I mean, could could the two winners of your fight and their fight meet? And because you you never fought high at cruiserweight, I mean, would that fight could it happen at heavyweight? Yeah, that's, that's possible. Anything is possible at heavyweight. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, indeed. That's that's a that's a, and that's an attractive setup right there. <laughs> I have nothing to that. I you know, listen, I fight whoever. You know, I'm told to fight. The money's right. Let's go. <laughs> or, and I, you know, what? truthfully, the money ain't right all the time. But you know. It, Right, so yeah, that's part. And was was a fighter with David Hay? I mean, ever in talks at Cruiserweight at all? Because you were you held the t- title when I, mean, I think he beat Mormek, and then he went on to fight um, Enzo Macronelli. Yeah. Um, I was told. I don't know how true it was because you know we we found out a few things were were just were lies at the time. From um, when I was signed with Don King, you know, we were told, yeah, you get the winner of Enzo. And David Hay, because you know it was a unification bout. So David Hay goes and beats Mormick, and he beats Enzo, 
And I'm, I'm, I was told that, or actually, before that, I was told I was going to get the fight with Enzo before he got the David Hay fight. And stuff didn't work. But we come and find out that, you know, some of those talks that we were told happened never happened. <laughs> it's just one of them things to hold you off, hold you off so the promoter can do what he wants. And same thing with the David Hay fight. So I, after the David Hay Enzo fight, I was, I was very angry because David Hay went on TV. Like he unified the whole division and I had the belt. And I'm like, I'm sitting there screaming, no, he didn't. But nobody here heard Steve Cunningham. Nobody knew me. So David Hay and me did a smart thing, you know. He didn't have to fight a tough fight in Steve Cunningham because nobody knew me, you know. Um, and it wouldn't have been enough money. So let's just breeze past this guy who's got a belt that nobody knows and just move on. And he, he did the right thing, you know. And let me ask you this, uh, moving on <clears throat> on the subject of David Hay. You as a fighter, you know, someone that's been in so many great battles, and you see a guy like Hay get the ultimate chance. He gets a shot to be the heavyweight champion of the world. And then he basically no-shows, and he tries to blame it all on some injured toe. As a fighter, does that offend you that he didn't appreciate the opportunity before him, excuse me, the opportunity before him, and he basically just didn't give his all? Um, <clears throat> for me personally, it's just one of them things, um, I, not that I don't care, but it's like, that happens. Some guy, they talk, you know, I mean, when you hear the hype and all of this, putting shirts with heads off on it, and, I mean, you knew Dave Hay was just talking his way into money, and that's what he did. You know, he went and collected a check. I mean, I don't know if it's told if that was real. You know, only he knows, or his team knows if that was real. We know he just didn't perform, you know, so... I can't really call that one, you know, but I mean, it is disappointing to me. I mean, because I'm a fan of boxing myself, not just a fighter. So it was disappointing mm -hmm. not to see uh, him fight back or him try to win, it seemed like. You know, it was disappointing. And <clears throat> getting back on the the Fury fight before we let you go here, because, of course, this is you know real reason we're here. Um, like When he went against uh, Neven Patchkick, he uh, went down the second round on a straight right hand. Do you believe that his chin is a liability, and do you think that a knockout is, act uh, knockout victory for you is actually a, uh, a, a, has a solid chance of happening? I mean, this is a heavyweight division, you know. Anything can happen. <laughs> um, even w when any man is fighting another grown man who's worked out for two months, as I did, it's possible, you know. Um, I don't. We don't base our camp on we're going to knock this. Out, you know, um, we just work, but we do, we do put that into, uh, into you know, we do take that into account that it could happen. But I'm here to work. I'm here to go 12 rounds if need be, and and still, you know, be fresh in the late rounds. And do you do you, um do you feel that the biggest problem that Fury really has to offer is his size, and and other than that, um, you know. I mean, basically, where do you see his skill level at? He's got a good skill level. He's got a good work. Um, he's got a good work ethic. You know, he's um, you know, as I said in the press conference, his, you know, the main reason he's beating guys is because he's big. I mean, you see, he leans and lays on guys, and he gets them tired. You know, then he can um, he does. That's one of his tricks. But he's also got a good boxing ability. You know, to be that big, he's pretty decent. You know, so uh, he's undefeated for a reason. You know, he's fought some solid dudes. You know, Chisora, Kingpin. A uh, few few guys and he beat them. So he's not just uh, he's not just going and then laying on guys and then they're <laughs> they're losing. He's he's putting in work, and we taking that into account. You know that's why I said it's not going to be an easy fight for either one of us until it's over. Then we can say, oh, that was easy. <laughs> and um, just before we go here, um, do you have any f uh, a final message for the fans and also for Tyson Fury? Uh, just um. To the fans, you know, um, you guys who know me, who follow me throughout my career as a cruiserweight, you know I give my all. Just expect to see the best Steve Cunningham the world's ever seen. Sounds great, Stephen. We really appreciate you coming on here. Good luck on the 20th, and um, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you in the future, and you'll be on your way to a heavyweight title shot. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot, man. We really appreciate you coming on. That's no problem, man. Thank you. Absolutely, and we'd love to have you again if uh, if uh, we can find if you can find the time for us. Okay, just let me know, and I'll be there. Sounds good, man. Hey, great luck. Go in there and give them hell. Sure, peace. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks, Steve.
Steve Cunningham, everyone. Great play.